I'm David Merritt. And I'm Francine Lacqua. And this is In the City, Bloomberg's podcast connecting you to the stories and the voices at the heart of the City of London. This week, a conversation with Luke Ellis, Chief Executive Officer of Man Group, the world's largest publicly listed hedge fund firm. Luke, thank you so much for coming in. It's great to be here. So you're one of the most famous hedge fund chief executive, if not the hedge fundy, but actually you have quite an interesting career path. Uh, I'm not sure whether famous is a is it's well, a it's definitely never thing. been a goal, and <laughs> and I guess. But look, given the public profile of man, it, it comes with the job, and you know I think we should, as a firm, take a leadership position on stuff because that's the position we have as an ability to do that type of thing. My career, well, I, I I was one of those people who from a very, very early age sort of love numbers and love patterns. And I, well, I was having a conversation with my grandfather about horse race betting when I might have been five or six and sort of worked out that the bookies were making money all the time and said, I'd like to do that. And he said, well, we like to say, go and work in the city. So I just, that was the point I knew I wanted to work in the city, but I didn't really know what the different jobs were. And of course, I'm old enough that this is pre-internet. So, you know, I, I took the first job I could find working in the city and things which, went from which there. Which was what? It was with Namura. It was as a graduate trainee. You know, our introductory speech was from the Japanese head of the office who said, the Bank of England tells me we need more white faces in the office. You're my white faces. And then he walked out. So you were the diverse hire. So we were the diverse hire. Now, I- I'm not going to claim that I have uh, suffered in diversity at all, but it, but it's just an interesting perspective of you know, the journey we've all come on. And that's fascinating. And of course, back in that moment, Nomura in Japan was sort of a very dominant force in world uh, finance. It, it's Those sounds amazing that, right? when you look back and think. So at the time, with one quarter's profit, Namura could have bought Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs cash. I mean, that used to be an amazingly profitable business. Now, I will admit, I, I took the job without knowing it was a Japanese firm. Was there were three jobs? Sorry, in you the, didn't know it was a Japanese. I didn't. Know. <laughs> there, there were again. It, it's it's like amazing. This you couldn't the, look the, it up on the internet, I suppose. Then no, you couldn't. So so I went into the careers office, which was a room full of books, and said I wanted to work in the city. And they said there are the accounting jobs. And I'm like, no, no, I don't want to do accountants. And there were three books, right, three pamphlets about three jobs. I applied for the three jobs. The first one that offered me a job, I said thank you very much. Uh, as was sitting outside having sort of signing the documents having said yes please that the, somebody said are you looking forward to the three months in tokyo and i <laughs> looked slightly nonplussed <laughs> looked around realized the decoration was a bit weird now you mention it and anyway i signed up to three months in tokyo which was a brilliant time so tokyo then you know one of the big financial capitals world still an important place but very different then tell us about arriving as a sort of trainee in tokyo and what that felt like that really was being othered Japan still doesn't like immigration. Back then, they had absolutely none. Back then, they were masters of the world. And, you know, the Japanese equity market was worth, I can't remember what we got to, 27% or something amazing of the global index. And, you know, it was sort of in the build up to the bit where the Imperial Palace was worth more than California in real estate value. It was that sort of amazing time in the mid 80s. And, you know, we we were tolerated rather than anything else, but it was a really interesting experience. Learned some Japanese, learned to understand the Japanese, which has been something that I've sort of leveraged off throughout my career, I guess. So, Luke, when you look back at that time, is it more surprising the the change, I guess, in Japanese finance that we've experienced over the last thirty years, thirty five years, or the change in the city of London? So, so the second, I mean, it was a classic bubble. And did I know when it was going to pop? No, but it didn't take very long to work out. This didn't make sense, right? I mean, you know, I can't remember. There were all sorts of sort of things about, you know, but a pineapple cost more than, I don't know, whatever, not quite a car, but that sort of thing in the West. You know, it was all sort of like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. And the fact that that burst is not that so much of a surprise. And many of the things that are amazing about Japanese society is how little has changed. Yeah, the city here was so radically different back then to now. And 
you know, sort of obviously lots has changed in the UK, lots has changed in Europe, but the, the sort of, I think the city back then had a, many of the worst aspects of the UK. And somebody was talking to me the other day about, you know, do you think there's no racism in the city or no misogyny? And it's like, well, of course there is. But compared to a period where it was, you know, materially worse than the national average, I would say the city is now at least as good as the national average and probably better. What happened back then? Again, is it tied to banking culture more than the city of London? It's very hard to get one's head around how unglobal finance was back then. And while I did a job going and working in Tokyo, that was so weird and unusual. And you know, most people working in the city of London would never have been outside Europe for work and not really been outside the city of London for work in most cases. You know, and what was going on in New York was very, very separate to what was going on in London. You know, because this is obviously before any of the big banks. As it goes, in, in the next couple of weeks, I'm about to be 60. So I'm, you know, this was a long time ago, but it, it was pre-Big Bang just before that. And, you know, it was it was a different thing, but it, it, it was a very insular insular environment which had a mixture of a sort of if you like a posh part of uk society that um that, that looked down on anything other than posh white men and we used to have that thing about barrow boys which somehow was i mean actually that got that's one area which hasn't really got better but but you know Back then, well, there was an awful lot of drinking. That was a very different thing in the culture going for... At lunchtime, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, going long. going for four or five pints at lunch was normal, not unusual. And still going back to your desk and working. It was, I mean, it's amazing when you look back at those things. It's a bit like sort of... Obviously, everybody smoked in the... I mean, not everybody, but all offices had people smoking everywhere and so on. But, but it was really just the attitude about being unpleasant to you know pick whatever you know if you weren't a posh white male the world was unpleasant to you and and britain as a whole has changed obviously enormously in those times and do you think the city has moved along with british society or is still lagging behind you said there are still some issues here how do you see the landscape today in terms of how people deal with these very british problems about class and uh, looking down noses on people with with less money. I mean, is it, how are we doing now here in the city? So, so I think it's gone from being materially worse than the UK to being at least as good, and I would say probably better in a number of aspects. So there is one thing in the city which, you know, by the nature of dealing with money all day, every day, it, it's pretty impossible to have a totally balanced attitude to money. Right and right, it's not normal, you know, right? It's not an average yeah, and, thing. Yeah, you, know, you move you billions and trillions of dollars, pounds, yen, whatever, every day, every whatever. It's it's quite hard to 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 not say some things to do with money, which sound weird in any other context. But but I think the the general thing of the culture has has really come a huge long way, and there's lots more we can do, absolutely. But you know and but there's lots more we can do in society, if you see what I mean. But I, I, I think we're, you know, it is, it is a healthy place today, and you know, sort of, yes. But we should all keep working on trying to make it an even better place if we can, open to as many people as possible, because the the whole point about the city is it is an intellectual boiling pot, right? I mean, it's about getting as much IQ together into, uh, yes, an individual, but then into a room and then into a building and then into the whole city. And, you know, it's, it is the dynamics of having all of this IQ bumping into each other, but you need diverse thinking in order to make that, uh, you know, a benefit. It's, it's that, you know, it's like one of the favorite expressions in the city is where there's no, you know, the only thing that's a free like a free lunch is diversity, is diversification, right? In a portfolio, 
you know, you diversify and that gets you improved returns, less risk. Every, every type of thing in finance is about diversification. And it applies just as much in people. If you have 10 people who are incredibly smart, but all have exactly the same background in different forms, they're not going to be much cleverer than one person. Maybe they'll be better than one, but they're not going to be better than five people or probably not better than two. You get people who've got a different perspective. The collective is much smarter. Because that's how you get away from groupthink. But how do you, and, and you've really championed, right, diversity in the workforce through indices and initiatives at MAN. How difficult is it to recruit diversely? Recruiting diversely for people coming in at the graduate master's level is not that hard, right? You, you, have, to, you have to have an attitude shift. And once you have an attitude shift, it's really not that hard. At that level, you know, there is a lot of people, and if you start by not saying what school did you go to and what college at Oxford are you at, but try and actually look at the individual person's capabilities and achievements and so on, you know, I, I yeah, I, I think it's easy to hire in at the graduate level in a in a truly diverse way. That the challenge is as you move up through the organization that you know, so our senior leadership, so that's sort of one level down from me and one level below that. So it's a it's a big cohort, it's sort of a couple of hundred people, and we are in the kind of sort of high twenty percent for gender diversity there. And as I say, compared to where the city would have been once upon a time, you know, that's amazing. But in reality it's still high twenties, it's not 40s, it's not even as high as where we are at the overall firm. And it's hard moving the dial and, and sort of even as you dig into that, you know, funnily enough, in the people talent side of our business, we have more senior female leaders than we do in the investment side of the business. And you sort of think, ah, but of course, the average person leading one of our investment teams has been doing it for 30 years. You know, and so that, that that bit of the funnel that came in means it's easy to do the right things about sort of senior positions, but it's hard to move the dial a long way. Is, is that the only reason, though, time, or are there other barriers still meaning women aren't progressing up to the top ranks of big city firms? Are there still some cultural um, hurdles that we need to unpack? So, so I mean, look, I'm... I'm definitely sure that the dominant thing is the pipeline problem, but you know it's not just how it was 30 years. You know, 15 years ago, people still used to celebrate the shouty, aggressive trading floor idea, right? That was the you know, and still, frankly, you see, you know, what the BBC did a program about the city, and it's you know still got shouting dealing floors and you know, a sort of machismo and, you know, it sort of heroes women who are more machismo than, you know, and, and that puts lots of people off, put lots of people off in the past. I mean, if you come on our dealing floor, you know, we trade, as you know, a lot. And Is there much the, shouting? None. No. But, but I mean, like yeah. none. The, the people complain it's too loud, but that's just people talking. Well, apart from me, we, I have, we a loud have the voice. same in the newsroom. Yeah, people talk to me. So much. it's not a prerequisite for success having that kind of shouting. no, not at all. No. And the and and yeah, but but the the first is broadening the pipeline of people coming in. The second is then making sure that you don't sort of celebrate the wrong type of culture, and that's where management comes in, and and you know that is where the good leaders are making a real difference, and some places not so much. And, you know, we could think of the coming back from COVID and some firms tried to make a sort of look at us, you know, we're the first ones back in the office. We've told everybody they have to be at their desk every day. And you're like, okay, but you that's didn't a, do that. No, because it's a dumb way to manage no. people. Yeah. And, in, in, you know, if you want to get the best out of people, telling them they all have to conform to some rule you learned 40 years ago is pretty dumb, honestly. And so, you know, what we try to do is to find the working process that gets the best out of each person. 
And so we've got people who are in the office five days a week from early to late, and we've got people who are, you know, dotted all over the country and, frankly, the continent don't come to the office very much. But that's how we get the best out of those people. Uh, Look, is that out of personal experience? So you left the city, right, at some point. Yep. Why, why did you leave and why did you come back? First point of earning money is so you can afford to live. And that is incredibly important. And we know there's an enormous number of people in this country and beyond who are struggling with just that every day, and especially now at the moment. You get get there. The second stage is in order to you know have enough that you can look after your family and you know savings and and then at some point you you have enough money that the money is supposed to create choices and it's amazing how many people get caught up in well I just want more money which is a choice it doesn't seem a terribly brilliant choice but it's a choice and there are some people where you know have done amazing things because they're driven purely by finance as a motive. Again, one of the reputations of the city is people only come into the city to make money. You know, but that's the thing of the 80s, right? It's not it's not the world today. People come to work in the city. People succeed in the city because they love the intellectual challenge of what is a like a brilliant if you've got a brain that likes complicated puzzles, finance is amazing, right? And it's always changing and that's I mean that's what got me excited. Uh, I was in a lucky enough position to have made enough money that I had choices. And I reached a point where I wasn't enjoy enjoying what I was doing. And so I stopped. To do what? And I didn't know. I mean, I stopped. And, and honestly, I did. If you'd asked me to guess, I didn't think I would ever come back to the city. I didn't think I'd come back to a full time work. But I don't know, I just, I stopped because I had a choice. I had an option you know, essentially my kid's life and my life was funded. And so... Was that a hard decision? Did you agonize over it or was it no, just clear? Not really, because, you know, it's one of the conversations I've had regularly over the last 30 or 40 years with my wife of, I work really hard because I really enjoy it. But at the point, you know, it, it's not good to go home and moan about, I'm not enjoying my work when, like, you don't have to do it. Now, I mean, again, it's entirely different if you've got to turn up at, you know, whatever, drive your truck every day in order to pay for gas and food. But, I, you know, once you're in a position where you, it's, you don't need the money in order to live a nice life, mm. you know, sort of moaning about your work seems really dumb. So what lured you back? So the, the, I came back for what was a new for me and look really interesting intellectual problem. So I sort of built a business for JP Morgan. So I built a business for somebody else. I built a business. This, that was my first go around, if you like, first career. Second career was to build a business with a partner, so for ourselves. And I didn't have an urge to do either of those things again. And what drew me back was so it was the time where man merged with GLG, bought GLG, however one wants to describe it. And I could see that this was a very complicated mess that they were creating. And the thought of how do you turn around a mess somebody else has created? I'd never done that. And it looked like a really interesting intellectual I mean, <laughs> problem. And it's been a really interesting intellectual problem. And Touch wood. That's we'll not find necessarily, out. you know, what draws most people to cleaning up other people's mess. I mean, I'm fascinated by that. You know <laughs> what? And you just because you, you could you see the opportunity through the mess of what you might be able to build at the end of it. No, honestly, <laughs> I mean that part of what made it really interesting was I could see the problems, and at the time it wasn't at all clear whether there was a path through the mess. Whether, but. That's I, I like complicated puzzles, if you like, and this was a people and you know finance and whatever puzzle, and that that was that is like a really I mean to me that that was like an irresistible. That's what brought me back. It was just an irresistible puzzle, and it I'm, has I'm been fascinated by that. And we often in the newsroom talk about you know Deutsche Bank went through four chief executives, Credit Suisse is the same. Like what draws people to difficult jobs? Can you? Can you point to 
I guess, characteristics in in people that you want to hire that make them succeed? Is it is it the intellect? Is it the the drive? Is it that fire in the belly? Like, what makes a good employee? The definition of believing in diversity is that there isn't a thing that makes a good employee. Right? That that is exactly part of the bit. Is you, you can't look at everybody on the basis of are they the best person for this thing right now? The the big leap in mindset is three years forward. Uh, you could pick a longer diet, but three years is sort of my attention span. So three, three years forward, is this team going to be better for that person being part of it? And because if you start by, you know, okay, Fred's left. I need to replace Fred. Who are the candidates that I can hire today who are the most suited for Fred's job today? And I say Fred on purpose. The answer is you're going to hire somebody who looks and sounds like Fred. You're going to hire exactly in the image of the person who left. You do that, you're never going to improve the diversity of thinking in the firm. If, on the other hand, you go, okay, Fred's left, that's life. But we now have a chance to bring other skills into this team. You know, we'll accept a sort of some J curve effect where we may not get the perfect fit for the immediate problem exactly today. But if three years from now, we can bring somebody in that makes the team better, the, you know, you can get much more out of that than, and, and so then you get to thinking about, okay, I want somebody who thinks differently, who's got a different, you know, because they actually help the thought process. So you can pivot, in fact, a whole business or a whole team's work around that person. You've mentioned puzzles a few times, sort of fitting pieces together, but this kind of question of diversity and who you bring in and the skills, it's about reconfiguring the pieces, isn't it, all around them, not necessarily fitting someone in. Yes. I mean, yeah, that's that's a very good way of saying it. And look, I, the, the sort of, if you like, the, the, the bit everybody sees, the bit Bloomberg celebrates of our job is the financial puzzles. But as you get into a management and then a leadership position, really what you're dealing with is people puzzles. And it's, you know, people are really interesting and complicated and so on. And so, yeah, it's about trying to fit those puzzles. So how do you get the best out of the team? How do you get the most going forward? And that sort of comes back to that. I definitely went off from one of your earlier questions. What, why do we think it's important to embrace different working practices for different people in different ways is because that's how you get that puzzle to be the best. People who feel good about what they're doing, people with a smile do better work. Right? We've all had to do some report, something that you know you don't really want to do. It's amazing how long it can take. Whereas if you're enjoying it, it's amazing how quickly like this podcast know, is flying by, saying, right? I don't know what you mean. I love waking up at 4 a.m. <laughs> For some time, London was the world capital of hedge funds and whole areas of the city were given over to the funds in sort of Mayfair and St. James's. We've written a lot about a lot of funds moving or shifting people, places like Dubai, uh, post-Brexit, around Europe. Is London still the centre of the world for this? You know, effectively one should think of New York, except it's not really New York, as being the centre, right? And so one one can claim some numbers for London relative to New York because of where people actually are in the States now. London has a massively dominant proportion of the non-US-based hedge fund people. Now, whether the business is somewhere X or Y, whether it's people working for a US firm but based in London – the you know the the sort of we all like the stories about somebody's moving to you know first of all it was Geneva and then they all came back and now maybe it's Dubai but never you know, Frankfurt no Fred, not really Frankfurt you know <laughs> and Frankfurt. Brexit was going to spread everybody all over Europe but it really didn't do that to the hedge fund business mm. it had a much bigger effect on private equity right um, but in actual hedge funds London is I mean so dominant in non US center of gravity in the US, you know, it used to be all New York and then it was Greenwich and Connecticut and well, maybe it's all becoming it's all Florida over. or 
so wherever the the I mean, you know, the, there there are people will do a trade for tax that is human nature. I would say, you know, that the, the trade off between it's a different trade off between New York and Florida than it is between London and Dubai, and even if the tax pickup is really a lot, it's not very. It's an expensive trade. Look, if you still think that London's a good home for hedge fundies, are you finding the right talent? Like, what's your biggest concern, actually, on diversity, employees, and actually keeping them here and happy? Yes, we're finding lots of really good talent. I think the I'm trying to get the right phraseology. So that the there was a period, uh, let's call it eighteen months ago, where but uh, the date's wrong, where. Everybody wanted to either go and work for a tech firm, preferably a startup, or they wanted to go and work for a crypto firm. And there was a period where it was hard to get, you know, raw talent. Um, you know, it was a fascinating thing that somewhere in the second quarter of last year, the both of those light bulbs went off. Mm. And it's back to being or blew up rather than well, it's off, um, right. <laughs> you know. But there's sort of they, they, you know, crypto blew up, and the tech people stopped hiring, and that means that there's an enormous amount of raw talent available. You know, would I like it that it was easier to get visas into the UK than it is? Yes, but you know, that's a political comment, and there's nowhere in the world that isn't currently more difficult on immigration than it should be, but. You know, it, it it doesn't it doesn't get in the way of hiring great talent and still very very diverse talent. You know, the number of nationalities we have is continues to go up. Look, when you look at all the in, the incentives, I guess that you have a man group to to keep that level of seniority with diversity, right, within your employees. Is there something that works better than others in terms of? getting and building the broadest team we can get. My conclusion is there is no silver bullet to this. What you have to do is lots of things which move it a little bit. And, you know, whether that's having, you know, supporting outside organizations, having lots of internal networks. So people, you know, you, you want people to feel like they belong, right? And that's a very important part of it. And that's how you get people to stay. It's a good word, belong. Right? It does not just mean they fit in. It's like they actually belong. And so one of the ways of that internally is networks. And you know, that's people who have similar attributes, whatever you want to say. And while we always make sure that they know they've got senior sponsorship, they're always organically done up from the bottom. You know, we've had big success with a returner program. This is getting people who've had a 10-year career break And they could have had the career break for all sorts of reasons, but I think practically all of them have been women coming back from parenting. We've had fantastic people out of that program that they've both added greatly to the firm and been, you know, I mean, to do great, grateful, that's a bad word, but whatever, to have had, you know, have people to have faith in them. But you can't hire 50 of those people every year. Because there just aren't that many people at that decision point in life. You know, the thing that we've always avoided, and I, you know, I've I've watched a couple of firms who tried to use their checkbook to go and run around and hire all the senior women they could find in the city, so they could say, "Look at us, our stats have gone up." And you know, while that might let them stand up and say, "Look, my stats gone up," it hasn't improved anything in the puzzle. So just throwing money at this doesn't fix the problem. Well, uh, but it's, look, uh, money can help in different ways, right? The, the, so that's not a bad thing. But but I mean, the bit of, if all you do is rob Peter to pay Paul, or maybe rob Jane to pay Sharon, you, you aren't doing anything very useful, right? And so I, I think it's important that, you know, what we're all trying to do is to, you know, bring people into the city and enable them to thrive and succeed. And, you know, so we organize a lot of mentoring for sort of anybody who needs it and wants it. But, you know, we make sure you know, that there's a lot more encouragement to 
um, sort of mid-level women to take mentorship because you know there is a thing about willingness to be pushy for themselves and it's not really about being pushy right but it you know and we try to always adjust for the you know ju just for the thing where a man shouts that they want the job and a woman says i'm not sure if i'm ready but one of the ways you try and adjust in all the talent planning but also one of the ways is in mentoring helping people understand both as a man that's not necessarily helpful but particularly as a woman yeah it's okay to say i'd like to give it a go um, we know that pay has not been equal right i mean we've talked about it on this podcast that and one of the reasons that there's still some cultural and across gender problems in the city is because um people aren't getting paid the same to do the same job i mean how much of a problem is that do you think um there'll be places where it's a big problem and places where it's not much of a problem in the effort of coming up with a simple stat that applies to every business in the country the government stats on gender pay gap are not really very informative so they you don't know, compare like would like to they sort of yeah averages. and it's just it, yeah exactly it's just that the, actually the population differences drive everything we're data nerds, right? So we have a lot of data about the people internally, and we work to come up with what we think is a true number. And the true number for us is a very low single-digit number, which you could say doesn't really matter, apart from it annoys the hell out of us because it's not a random number. It's you know it's a few percent one way each year, and we keep doing things to try to get rid of it entirely and you know and and it shows somewhere some of the residual bits are really difficult you know one of the good things that's happening is you know there are definitely you know today a female sort of successful portfolio manager has a higher market worth than a male successful portfolio manager of equal thing now, you know, that's not true in every job in every way. You know, similarly in, in the US, a successful, uh, you know, a performing successful black person has a higher market value in, you know, there's a sort of 25 to 30% premium in, in comp today, that way around. And like, that's a good thing because, you know, somewhere you start to move the overall averages in the right way. What happens to the Barrow Boys that you were talking about from the eighties? So that's been a, I, I, that, that's been one of the sad bits of, you know, that I think, you know, social mobility in the UK is a big problem. It's easy sitting in London to focus on, you know, the, the sort of some of the obvious diversity issues within London, but when you get to the UK. You know, white working class boys are the underperforming group out there, and and it's a big group, right? It's not a, you know, it's whatever thirty percent type of thing. It's, um, and so, you know, sort of something I believe in. We believe in, and so we've tried to find things, and and then we've been one of the sort of founder sponsors of an initiative for the city of London, which is trying exactly to work on social mobility and. I would say that's the last bastion of open prejudice that is, you know, sort of people need to break down, right? That, that asking somebody what school they went to is not an interesting question, and yet it is still far too often a question people have. And people go, yeah, I went to a comprehensive school. Do you want to know the name? Or probably not, right? Uh, and... It, 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 you know, so you know, I think there is definitely more we could do, uh, and you know, it's again the sort of the Barrow Boys used to be a joke that was about separating two classes within the city. The joke may have gone, but you know that there's further we can go on that. Luke, thank you so much. Been a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to this week's In the City. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, if you like our show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe. 
This episode was hosted by me, David Merritt. And me, Francine Lacqua. It was produced by Summer Sardi. Additional editing by Blake Maples. And special thanks to Luke Ellis.